everybody for having me. It's good to be with you. Um, all right, so I'm Matt Fenwick. I um, run True North Content and we're a content strategy training production outfit uh, based in Canberra, Australia. We do a lot of work for government and we love big, messy content projects. A lot of our stuff is web-based, but we do do, um, you know, annual reports. And I'm, I'm basically just fascinated by messy environments like this this shopping center here you know how do you organize information in a way that people can find what they need it's somewhat ironic that i found myself in this field as a content strategist and information architecture because i get lost walking out of a shop you know i'll i'll, I'll walk out and be like which way do i go again so physical wayfinding not so much my strong point but information wayfinding um, better, definitely better. All right, so what is information architecture? Good question, glad you asked. So um, I'm gonna open up chat and imagine that you're looking for olives. I would like you to put in chat oh, everything that um, you can see that would, oh no, I showed you the answers. Damn it, hang on. I'm just going to get rid of this. Sorry. Blah, blah, blah. Present. So there are just like too many. Okay. All right. You're looking for olives. In chat, put everything that you can see that would help you find your way around or find the thing that you need. Numbers, yeah, yeah, the aisle numbers, excellent, Shauna, thank you. The sign, yeah, the information up the sign, good, thanks, Joss. What else? Oh, here we go. Uh, names of similar objects, staff members, categories, colours grouped on shelves. Yeah, you, you're getting a picture. So I'll, I'll just um, pull out two things in particular there. Got names of similar objects, colors grouped on shelves. Um, I, didn't, Belinda, I actually didn't know that. I've been using Coles online for ages. So um, we've got categories. So if I'm looking for olives, I will know that they're somewhere near pickles, for examples, for examples. And I like the, uh, the staff members um, example, like uh, that's like the equivalent of website search. Um, all right, so. I think, here we go. So this is all of the stuff that I came up with. And you've mentioned the, a lot of them already, like numbers, shelf labels, the structure of the uh, structure of the shelves themselves. So all of these things are part of information architecture. It's about taking a complex um, set of information and making it easy for people to use. Um, so this is um, Peter Morville. He wrote one of the lead textbooks on this subject. And so he says that IA's job is to help people understand where they are, what they've found, what's around them, and what to expect. So information architecture is super, super pragmatic. Uh, and we obviously see information architecture on websites. So we've spoken about categories, uh, and you can see an example of that here. The search bar, that's sort of like the staff member in the shopping, uh, in the supermarket. You can ask for help. Um, but you also see information architecture in other domains. And I've pulled out just a couple of them. We've got table of contents. So if, if you're a documentarian, this is going to be super relevant to you. Um, you can think about information architecture and wayfinding, even as it applies to physical spaces like the, like the London tube map or to an Ikea store. There's a reason they laid it out like that, so you'll spend hours in there and end up really hungry. Um, now, I should just say, um, actually, I might just, I'm just gonna open up the chat window so I can see any questions as we go. All right, Groovy. Okay, now, without information architecture, we end up with this. Um, so if you were wandering into that bookstore, what would you what would you do when you saw that? 
Answers in chat or voice is fine. Whatever you feel comfortable with. Yeah, walk out. Got walk out. <laughs> walk slowly. Okay. Turn around and leave. Okay. Cool, cool. Tend to see one of two reactions. Uh, one is to leave, and then the other one is to ask for help. Um, probably look at the most organised pile. That's optimistic, Tali. So um, when we don't have information, um, when we don't have information organised, people spend a, a, a lot more time trying to find what they need. And actually, um, I'm just putting something in chat. Um, Colleen Jones and um, her book is The Content Advantage. This is a really interesting one for documentarians because research by Colleen Jones shows that the findability of information affects people's whole perception of that information. So it's credibility, it's trustworthiness, it's polish. So as documentarians, if we're thinking about how can we make our content credible, we need to be thinking about the, the wayfinding navigation. Which brings me to the next slide. So when we're thinking about navigating through information, we want to be designing the scent of information. This is a concept that was popularized, popularized by Jared Spool, just putting his name in the chat. So the idea is that people will come into the information at a particular point, and then they get a really clear trail that leads them to the thing that they need. So the experience we want is a bit like this dog here. You know, it's found a trail, it's happy, it knows what it's looking for. Um, this is an example from um, the National Archives. So we teamed up with Oxide Interactive and we did um, content, content strategy, writing, bits of information architecture. And this is one example. So the National Archives has a really strong emphasis on um, education and programs for, for school children's. Um, so this is their learn section. And you can see that like if I came to the National Archives website and I was looking for um, information about school visits, click on the NAA, get to learn. And you can see here we've got school visits first. So when you are designing your documentation, something to think about is how can we create this really clear scent from whatever people's entry point is through to the thing that they need. So that's an example that's hopefully, hopefully uh, um, giving people a strong scent. This is an example that's uh, not as strong. And by the way, I'm moving fairly quickly. If you have any questions, um, please just pop them into chat and I'll, I'll probably get to them at the end. So uh, I picked this because it's a document um, but what do you think the problem is with the, the, the navigation and the wayfinding in this table of contents? Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah, exactly. The, the repetition. Looks like poetry or creative writing. Sure, it probably is, but um, no grouping. Yeah, that, yeah, good. D -D -I, I hadn't thought of that. So if I'm, um, apologies if I'm mispronouncing your name. So the two things. So the repetition of the girl that was, the girl that was, and so on. So when we're designing labeling, we want to be front loading. Uh, we want to be front loading the information. So that means leading with an information carrying word. So that when people are scanning down the list, the, the thing that's different jumps out at them. And yeah, um, on to Aditi's point, the, the grouping. So it's a very, very flat structure. If we wanted to make this a bit more usable, we might have a category girl and we subdivide that. Um, stories about the girl and stories about father and so on. So that's an example of something that doesn't give a strong scent um, of navigation. Okay, I'm going to shift gears now and talk about categories. Um, there are a lot more sort of uh, a lot more facets to information architecture but I wanted to concentrate on the things that I think are most relevant to um, documentarians. So um, this is an example of bad categorization. Now when categorization is bad, it's like um, imagine, it's like the, the bookshop that we saw, uh, where are we? It's like this bookshop, right? There's no categorization applied anywhere. So you need to like 
pick through each item one by one. Now, looking at this, um, so the first thing is that there's no chunking. When we categorize things, we group them into, into chunks, right? Um, so that you only have to process um, a limited amount of information at a time. So, you know, you can, uh, you, you can chunk enormously large volumes of information, like the, uh, the gov.uk example that we had there, where there was, you know, all of the information, but it was chunked down to things like benefits, right? And obviously you can have subcategories. So there's no chunking. There's poor resemblance beneath, between items. Remembering we were talking about um, olives and how, you know, if you saw pickles, you'd know that olives were nearby. So when we're creating categories in our, in our documents, we're grouping like things together. But looking at this, you've got like an a, a article about baby boomers right next to the stock market, next to opinion pieces. And then you've got something about, you know, the election. So things don't feel like they belong together. And then finally, the labels are really unclear. We've talked about this already in navigation. You know, tools and more. It's, you know, it's basically like, uh, I gave up. And uh, I, I know in website navigation, we're usually really, really suspicious of catch-all navigation categories like resources or FAQs. If anyone wants me to spend two minutes going into exactly why FAQs are a terrible way of structuring information, go ahead. Let me know and I'll, I will, I will um, hold forth. But so I wanted to do a really quick exercise and given the time, I probably won't do, oh, okay, okay. All right, we'll, we'll make time for the, my FAQ rant. Okay, given time, um, we won't do this as a full and interactive exercise. I'd normally do it in Miro or something, but I would just like you to look at these items and identify the categories that you would use to group that information. And what I'd like you to do is to, to sort of come up with it, the categories in your head and then write them in chat, because I don't want you to be influenced by what other people are writing for a very specific reason I'll show in a second. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds to think what they are. And then when I say go, I want you to write them in chat. So we'll do the 30 seconds starting now. Hey, Shauna. No. Well, they're all cartoon characters, right? No, no, everyone, hold off. Hold off on writing them in. Oh, jeez. People. People, hold off. Um, we, I'll, I'll let you know when it's ready, when you're ready to, to, to write. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and go. Type your categories in. Okay. Yep. Yep. Nice. Nice. Cool. Cool, cool. Let's just uh, let's just wind it back and look through those. Um, so um, a fair few of you had um, the kind of like the, the 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 brand Disney, Warner Brothers, or or Network Studio, and so on. Um, Belinda has human and non-human. Uh, Marianne has species. Um, yes, yeah, some are superheroes, some aren't. Um, oh, Jack's got female, male, animal. So the, the, the thing that I wanted to do or, or to draw out here is that categorization is inherently subjective and categories can often overlap. Okay, so, you know, if we had, um, if we had, say, um, you know, Donald Duck here, that might fit into animals, it might fit into Disney, you know, so categorization is fluid. It's not like um, your biological classification where like a, a, a dog only has one spot. So when we're coming up with categories, like how you organize your documents, it's helpful to bear in mind the subjectivity of the process. And what we did, just now is a really, really quick version of card sorting. 
if I was doing this, if we had a bit more time, we would spread, actually I'll show you the, the mock-up I was going to use if we had time. Now, so you grab the items, move them around into categories and then assign labels. Um, I'll have some resources about that at the end, but um, we, we saw when I just put it out there that everyone came up with a pretty wide variation of, um, of categories. What if I told you that you're researching cultural bias in cartoons? What categories would you create then? And feel free to just chuck it in, chuck it in chat when you're ready. So cultural bias in cartoons, what, are, what categories would you create? Mm-hmm. Yep, country of origin, absolutely. Gender, yep, totally. So that was very, very quick. And so when, yeah, yeah, I'm, I don't know if that's cultural bias so much. Um, sexualization, really good point, Tali. Yep, um, so you can, our oh, era, okay, got it, got it. So you can see that when we focus on our intent, what we want to achieve through the categorization, then it's much easier to, um, it's much easier to generate those categories. Um, cool, cool, all right. So just as a really quick exercise, um, this is the ACT government's COVID information site. What do you think of their categories and do you think it gives a strong scent of information? Feedback in chat, please. I'm sorry, Tali, I'm just going to... Uh... What do you mean by this sort of assuming what you need to know, Tali? I'll just take myself off mute because yeah, cool. I think it's easier to explain. But they've put categories. I don't know if they've tested whether these are the most kind of popular pages or the topics that, that people are searching for. Um, but it seems like, how do you know that I want to know affected areas, what I can and can't do, business and work. Yeah. Like, how do you, how do you know that I don't want to, for example, look at um, looking after my mental health first, or you know, health and professional information or changes to restrictions? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah good point. Um, the answer is they didn't have much research, like a. COVID comms has been done very, very quickly. Yeah, I can imagine, um, yeah. And uh, yeah, Shauna, I hadn't thought of that about the pronouns, but you're right, particularly what you can and what you can and can't do. I um, in terms of the categorization specifically, if I'm a hair, if I own a hairdressing salon in Tuggeranong, which is in the south of Canberra, I might look at any any one of those things. Right. So this is what we call an ambiguous classification scheme. There's ways around this by, um, you know, like posting things in multiple areas, but it does feel a bit fuzzy. Um, by the way, a really good person to follow uh, on this space. I've been doing attending some of her courses. Max Hanley is very senior information architect. She's good to keep an eye out. Okay. So. Um, I am going to put up the resources in a second. We'll, we'll, we'll share these slides with you. I'm going to spend two minutes on FAQs and then I'll throw it over to questions. Um, Swapna, is that okay in terms of timing? Yeah, that should be fine. We've got time. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. All right, FAQs. So just to be super, super clear, what I'm talking about here is standalone pages on a website called Frequently Asked Questions, where it collects all of the miscellaneous questions that people might have in one place. So, gosh, a couple of, um, a couple of problems with that. Um, firstly, we generally want to be answering people's questions at the time 
it arises. So just back on the COVID example, let's say I'm looking at changes to restrictions. I want to know the answer to my question there. I don't want to have to go across to a whole separate page to find the answer. And people tend to be super, super focused and almost like blind. What's the word? Um, they, they have blinkers on when they're looking at content. So if they don't see the answer to their question right then and there, they may, they, they may not realise it exists at all. That's one thing. A second thing is that it doesn't give a strong scent of information because FAQs are typically super miscellaneous. They'll just throw a whole bunch of random stuff in together into one page. And if, I, if my question isn't answered straight away, maybe it's answered, you know, like two or three scrolls um, down the page, again, I won't see them. It's also bad for SEO. Google will reward content that has a really, really clear focus and it's rich about COVID restrictions. For example, FAQs by their very nature are miscellaneous. You know, it is that whole bunch of stuff thrown in together. Now, a couple of qualifications. Number one, always go with the evidence. You know, if you have some documentation or a website with an FAQ that's FAQ page that's performing well, then, you know, that, that counts. I would still have some questions about, are they just looking at the FAQ page because the rest of your navigation isn't as strong as it could be? Maybe. Other things to flag is that um, often on um, particularly software providers' websites, they will have FAQ sections embedded within a specific page. I'd want to test that, but, you know, that, that can often be fine because it's super focused, right? It's, you're looking at software product, here are the questions about that product. Um, and finally, um, using a question and answer format in your content can be okay, but I, I would just, I would flag that, um, what is the reason for COVID restrictions? So I've just popped that in chat and that's an example of a question frame and heading format. But you can see that it's not front loaded, right? Um, if I wanted to front load it, uh, I might do something like this, you know? So I, I wanted to flag those little caveats um, just to say that, um, in, that, well, what I'm anti is a whole bunch of random stuff thrown on a, dis, uh, on a separate page. There are some instances where FAQ style stuff can work well. And that's the resources. These are my details. Please connect with me on LinkedIn in particular. I'm pretty active there. Well, this is my email address. And now questions. And Swapnil, I'll, I'll just please interrupt when it's time to, to switch. Oh yeah, that's fine. Uh, look, if someone's got any, if anyone's got any questions, if you want to just, you know, unmute yourselves and ask the question directly, feel free to do that. Or I put it in the chat. Yeah, Tali, go for it. Thanks, Swapnil. Um, Hey, I have a question, Matt. Um, with the FAQs, um, what if there is no real kind of way to incorporate some of the questions that people might be asking um, on, your, on your website? So if, for example, um, it's like quite a simple system and, um, you know, you can't really have too much too many tool tips or too much in context help because it will just, you know, blow everything out. Um, what, you know, what can you do to avoid having FAQs in that scenario? Yeah, cool. I'll, I'll, I'll have a crack at answering it and let me know if I've sort of addressed your question correctly. So I, I, I'm assuming that you've got like a, a, a sort of an interface. Um, yeah. And so you, you, you don't have space to put a whole other component um, within the new space. Mm -hmm. So, or a whole other content block. What I'll do in that situation is possibly have a separate section on the website called help. And then yep. I would structure that help section um, based on the, the specific topics. Right, um, gotcha. I would tend towards topic-based categorization we haven't had time to go into categorization schemas today. The resources that I've shared will mention it, but topic is a pretty reliable one, generally. Yep, yep, cool. 
And I, I find that can happen as well with pretty large websites where maybe fitting in certain information is difficult um, on particular pages. So they just sort of put all of the outliers on FAQ yeah. sections. Yeah, I mean, FAQ pages can be, or, or resources sections on web pages, it can be yeah. giving, you know? Yeah, Go, yeah. Oh, I can't make sense of this. I'm just going to plonk them somewhere. Hopefully so would you, would you argue then perhaps having a bit more of a go at navigation and linking off to particular resources in, say, a resources page rather than having FAQs? So, um, if so have, like, short answer is yes, yeah. Okay. So you, you can link off to the, you know, to the the source for longer help. Um, again, I just have some reservations around resources pages. This is definitely something that you'd want to test. But yeah. when we do do information architecture testing, a resource, the resource heading, it's a it's a really strong magnet, and people mm. tend to expect everything they need to be on yeah. the resource, whether it is. And then, yeah, it could be under any kind of, yeah, descriptor. I get, I get it. Right. Cool. Yeah. Right. I think I'll, I'll tinker with those ideas, but thank you. Okay, cool. No worries. Yeah, we just got time for probably one more question. Sean has put into the chat. How do you identify the lowest common denominator for the audience's reading level? Yeah, good question. Um, let me think about that. So first thing is that there are some um, there are some tools, namely um, readable is one, visible thread is another. Both of those tools pay are uh, paid tools. Um, readable's kind of license is a lot more accessible than visible thread, which is an enterprise level tool. So they will they will scan. Um, content, they have options for either documentation or websites, uh, and they will tell you the reading level. Um, what, so uh, when I first discovered reading level, I was pretty hardline about it. And I said, uh, I was running an annual report project at a government department. And I said, all of our content must be at a, a 12, you know, a, a 12 reading level, which means that someone who's 12 years old, could easily understand that content. And just super quickly for context, um, um, you calculate this by typically looking at sentence length, number of contents, number of complex words in the content. Anyway, the beef that I have with it is that it's a, it's a proxy measure. It doesn't actually tell you if your language makes sense to people. It just tells you if it, you know, triggers a, an, an algorithm. And so as an example, the word environment, environment, is four syllables long, which would be counted as a complex word, which would skew your ratings, but it's a word that, you know, everyone knows. So, you know, t the short answer to your question, Shauna, is that um, I use readability um, indexes as an indicator of content quality, particularly when I'm doing content audit. They are a handy um, leverage tool for our senior stakeholders because they feel sciencey, you know. Um, but I would be um, relying more on um, either user testing or using some simple tools like Google Trends if you want to interrogate specific variants of language to tell you what's likely to work better. Okay, cool. Um, any other questions, hit me up via the, via the LinkedIn. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Matt. That was really interesting. Thank you for presenting. Uh, we've got Michelle talking about developer advocacy now. So over, over to you, Michelle. Hi. I uh, just wanted to check that you guys can see my screen and see me and everything's all good. Yeah, perfect. Go for it. Alrighty. Cool. I'll get started then. So thanks, Sobnil, for having me at uh, the Write the Docs Australia meetup for today. I look forward to attending some of these more often because I'm learning more about writing docs myself. So this is great. Um, but today I'll be talking about developer advocacy, also known as developer relations, um, and why it's an important role. You might even get inspired to join me um, in developer advocacy if you aren't already. So at any time, you can post your questions in the chat. I can't actually see the chat at the moment, so I'll just let it keep flowing 
um, until maybe at the end when I'll take some questions um, or I might pop in at some points during the presentation. So I also better put a timer on so I can track. I've got 20 minutes. Perfect. So just a little bit about me. Um, I'm the developer advocate for Telstra Dev. Uh, Telstra Dev is Telstra's API and IoT marketplace. So hopefully you guys know all about um, APIs and where they're hosted on portals. So that's our API portal. Um, before that, I was in networks engineering at Telstra's 5G innovation center on the Gold Coast. Um, but I'm back in Adelaide now working from home in this role. Um, and outside of work, I'm obsessed with South Korea. So the food, the language, the music, the culture and everything. And I'm also an optimist on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and how we can use technology to help meet those goals. So that's what sort of drives me um, at Telstra as well. And that's just my Twitter handle there if you guys are keen to, to follow me around. Um, to set some context, because telcos don't usually come to mind when you think of open API, agile, software-driven docs and stuff like that. Um, you usually think about mobile phones and home broadband. Um, but we're making sure that the century of network capabilities that Telstra has is continued to evolve into a software-defined, machine-to-machine, data-driven ecosystem that you can access via APIs. Um, so this is our developer center um, at dev.telstra.com. Um, and it's sort of like the raw ingredients for making sense um, of the network. So our main one is the messaging API, um, where you're allowed, where we allow you to send and receive SMS and MMS with just a few lines of code. So that's pretty good um, as opposed to like having to manually send text and stuff. So um, I'll leave it at that for now. We have a couple of IoT APIs and um, track and monitor APIs, etc. But that's not what I'm talking about today. So you can ask me about those later. So today I want to talk about developer advocacy. Um, the three things. What is developer advocacy? Why is developer relations crucial? And how might you pursue developer relations? Um, full disclosure, I only heard about developer advocacy in March this year when I first got this job. Um, but I soon realized that I'd essentially been doing developer advocacy or, or technical evangelism already for the last two years before that in the 5G Innovation Center. And the year before that as the um, tour guide and social media lead for Adelaide Smart City Studio. So they're not technically developer advocacy stuff, but I really was doing that. Um, especially when you're talking about new technology like 5G, um, I spent most of my days explaining to explaining 5G in ways that people of all levels of business from all industries could understand. And that's really the key of, of evangelism and advocacy is making people understand it and, and use it. Um, so because I started in the middle of the pandemic, um, even though I've been to dozens of events all around Australia and some um, internationally, I haven't left my room to do any of that. Um, so I'm not an expert on developer advocacy, but I definitely have had a lot of experience in the last six months alone and wanted to share that with you guys. Uh, by the way, if you're wondering why avocados, um, that comes from a developer advocacy saying um, where developer advocates are the good kind of fat in a business. So they keep the community happy, they keep your products healthy, even though they might sound expensive. Um, but if you're the farmer, you know, avocados take a long time to grow, but they're very profitable in the end. So that's why avocados. But let's get some assumptions out of the way. So there are a lot of stereotypes about developer relations. Maybe you guys can post in the chat. I'll just check the chat. Um, what, like, what assumptions, or what assumptions you might have um, about developer relations? Let me just go back. Um, luckily, I didn't know any of these stereotypes before I joined. I knew nothing about developer advocacy. Um, my mum still thinks I spend all my day doing engineering things, which is kind of true. Um, my friends still think that I just spam Twitter and LinkedIn all day, which is also slightly true. Um, but I see it as the last one. It's, it's a big responsibility to keep a growing community happy keep the products that Telstra provides useful and things like that. But yeah, what, what do you think that developer advocacy is? So before I joined today, do you guys work with developer advocates? Are you a developer advocate? Um, have you seen them like on Twitter or at events? Like what do you think developer advocates are? Go ahead and, and post in the chat. Uh, but I'll keep going. So like I said, you may hear it be called developer relations or developer evangelist. Um, and the role of a developer advocate is different depending on the company that you work at, depending on the interaction that you have with developers, what the goal of the company is with developers. So for example, a software company might have a 24 seven team of advocates, um, but I'm currently the only official developer advocate that I've met at Telstra. Um, but as we get more and more into software and services rather than a traditional telco, everyone at Telstra has to embody the skills needed for developer advocacy. But here's a, a standard definition. So if you ask me what it is, 
A developer advocate is someone whose job it is to help developers be successful with the technology, act as a bridge between engineering team and the developer community. So if you want to summarize it in one word, it's a bridge with bridges between the business and the outside of the business. Um, yeah, so I'll keep going. Um, I'm actually a developer advocate and a product specialist for API and IoT products at Telstra Dev. I'll speak a bit more about those two in a bit. Um, but the mission I work on is centered around developer experience. And that's really the end goal for Telstra and for me, um, creating frictionless developer experiences that developers can work with. And if you guys are writing documentation, you'll definitely be across all that. Um, so my first stakeholder is the developers. It's, I'm here for the devs. Um, and that could be API consumers, it could be people tinkering with the IoT network, it could be you know, makers, hardcore devs, our tech partners like Microsoft and IBM and Amazon, or it could be hobbyists at home that are just working with APIs. And my next stakeholder, second one of course, is for the company. I need to make them successful too. And as a developer advocate, I'm everything to everyone. So I'm whatever the company or the devs need at any time. Um, whether that's strategy, community engagement, DevOps, product engineering, product management, customer liaison, incident resolution, everything. And I've done all of that today already and it's only, you know, lunch time. Um, <laughs> so here's what I do with the devs. The first thing is content. So writing blogs, um, writing guides and tutorials, um, running webinars and workshops to help developers, um, you know, know how to use our products. Um, the next one is engineering. So working on code snippets, for example, that we can use as sort of samples um, in our SDKs, GitHub repos, putting together working demos, and of course, readable documentation. So um, I'm not the author of Telstra's documentation, but I influence it um, and help the engineering team work on that. Um, on the product side, just getting feedback from the developers, you know, understanding their pain, watching them use the products and seeing what they need help with and how we can actually influence Telstra to, to change and build new things. Um, running lots of developer interviews, so talking to people that use the product and, and getting lots of feedback, so that's really fun, um, seeing how people use our stuff. And then it's the community engagement, so speaking at conferences and meetups. Um, I'm not in sales, so it's not like product pitches. You know, today I'm, I barely even talking about what Telstra Dev has, it's more about what we do, um, how to use our APIs and IoT products, doing fun demonstrations and just a bit of education piece. Um, so a lot of that includes, you know, event organizing, preparing, you know, preparing prizes and stuff like that. Um, community also comes with managing uh, the social channels that we have. So monitoring the forums, um, monitoring our Twitter page, posting on Twitter. Um, and you guys might have in your company Slack or Stack Overflow and things like that that a developer advocate would, would look at. But where I probably spend most of my time as a developer advocate is with support. So debugging, troubleshooting, helping developers, um, a little bit of pre-sales. It's not glamorous work, but it's really rewarding. Um, so don't think that developer advocacy is all fun and games. Most of the time I spend, yeah, troubleshooting and debugging. Um, I've got some of their customers. Uh, I'll just check back in the chat if there's any questions so far. Yeah, cool. Keep, um, keep posting your questions in and I'll address them all at the end. Um, so like I said, you're everything to everyone. So I'm everything for the developers, but the company also expects a lot of you too. Um, people have said that it compared me to marketing, compared me to sales, compared me to engineering, product management, but really I'm all of them and none of them at the same time. So um, one of the things I work on for the company is strategy. I try to be the first to know any changes in the market, latest tech trends, know what developers are talking about, um, influence and influence our technology roadmaps. Um, like using that. Um, one of the most fun things I love doing is prioritizing the feature backlogs of some of our products to say, this is what our developers want, this is what the market is doing, and we should prioritize this first. So that's really fun. Um, I don't want to say marketing, but it's, it's spreading awareness about our offering to interested developers. So definitely not sales, kind of marketing, but making sure that you know the, the voices are out there, people know that we have APIs and IoT developer tools. Um, User experience, so maintaining products to make sure that the users are getting what they need out of them. Um, I don't own any of the products. I'm not the author of the documentation, but I use the constant feedback I get from developers to help improve that. Um, I'm wondering if any of you guys here on the call have the developer relations people maybe helping you with the work um, the work that you do. So we've got, I think, 20 plus people on the call. 
Um, hopefully some of you have interacted with, with Deborah before, so I'd love to hear your experiences maybe at the end. One thing I've been doing a lot lately on this, which I'm very excited about, is working on our new portal. So I work with um, UX designers, UI designers, branding um, and product owners to make, we're designing a new portal. So as a developer advocate, I'm the voice of the developers in there. So saying, okay, this might be a really good design feature, it might look pretty, but developers won't get that or they won't resonate with that or things like that, so that's fun. I work with the DevOps teams to file bugs that I get, um, you know, find out through troubleshooting with the customers. Um, and then the most important thing I think is these internal feedback loops. So finding beta testers for our new features. Uh, I host customer feedback sessions or empathy sessions to really understand the developer problems and find ways to improve our products. Um, I see the use cases that the developers are using our product for. So that sort of like feeds back into Telstra on how we use our product. So I'm really a representative of our users and I'm influencing Telstra's products and services to suit the needs of the developers. Um, but internal feedback also includes like upskilling the Telstra, Telstra colleagues that might be in sales or they might be in, in DevOps, like how can I help them as well. So quick time check, I've got about 10 minutes left, that's great. Um, so as a developer advocate, I've been part of dozens of virtual events this year already, like the API Days conference, um, developer meetups um, and things like that. Um, but I love hackathons. Uh, I spend most of my time in hackathons with the project teams, like mentoring them. So seeing what amazing ideas they have and helping them actually reach, you know, their end goals. Um, I love judging as well. I'm always inspired by what I see coming out of hackathons and, and challenges like this. Um, one of my highlights of this year was teaching a class of 10 year olds at Code Club how to use Python and Raspberry Pis. So it's not, like I said, I'm not trying to sell to these 10 year olds. It's about making sure that people that use our products know how to use them. So that was really fun. Um, also mentoring young change agents. Um, and I also lectured at RMIT on their IoT course. So had a lot of fun this year um, doing that. I don't just speak at events though. I also run events as a developer advocate. Um, we've got the Melbourne IoT meetup. So now it's called Oz IoT. So it's capturing everyone in IoT. Um, we don't talk about our products there. It's not like me talking about IoT Telstra every day. Um, I barely even talk at these, but it's an idea of how I can bring um, IoT enthusiasts together to share best practices, get some tips and meet like-minded people. So it's all about um, fun and networking. If any of you guys are in the IoT space or either with work or in your hobbies, um, definitely search for this on Meetup and we'll see you there. So that's just a couple of things that that we do as developer advocates. So the developers I work with are big and small. So they could be hobby farmers who have never used APIs before, but they want to implement some environmental monitoring alert system. Um, to make their harvesting more efficient, or they might be the Australian government relying us to send some critical updates to millions of Australians. So either way, no matter how big or small, the problems that developers are solving are massive, and I want to get out of their way. So <laughs> the future is software defined. We're going to rely heavily on secure, well implemented apps, and uh, underpinning that is, is APIs. So I want to make sure that, you know, the less they need my help, the better, um, so that we can sort of make sure we're making good products that you know, can be self sufficient. Um, empowering our users to reach their goals. So, you know, I find my work incredibly valuable and important because I can help others to do amazing work. Um, you know, people that are changing lives, they're running countries, they're running essential services. Um, so if we make this developer successful, we'll make our product successful, making the developer successful, making the product successful, and it's a, it's a really good reinforcing loop. I've only got one more slide, so I'll just, I've seen we've got a couple of questions in there, which is amazing, and I'll get to those in a second, keep posting your questions. Okay, so my last uh, slide for the content here is, I think developer advocates, to be successful, it's about your personality. So you need to be passionate about helping others to be successful with technology. You're going to be doing some negotiation and compromise with your internal stakeholders, which is usually the hardest part, working inside the business. Um, so you always need to be positive and helpful getting people hyped about the problems and that your developers need solving so that your, your team is motivated to solve them. Um, developer advocates can really come from anywhere in the business. They're not just developers that get hired as developer advocates. I was in networks engineering, but because I ran a YouTube channel and had a podcast outside of work, that gave me the skills and experience that I needed to be a good developer advocate. Um, so the experience you need is really just contributing to a community, whether that's through open source contributions, writing blogs, attending and participating in hackathons and stuff like that. So um, that's just the skills, interest and experience that I would say 
that a good developer advocate needs, but you know, depends on the company. As for how to do it, how to get into it, um, just be in the space, meet other developers, participate in hackathons, present at meetups like this, submit pull requests for your company's GitHub, um, and just, you know, developer advocates just do what they love doing and they do it anyway. So it's writing code, helping developers and talking about developing stuff. So yeah, I wasn't a dev myself, um, but I love talking about it. So that's what you need. So that's all the content I had for today. Um, I hope that made sense and busted some myths about developer advocacy. Um, I'm keen to answer some of your questions. Before I go though, um, please join us at some of the upcoming events. We've got the Telstra Health Hackathon. We need developers, we need essential workers, we need hustlers and hipsters um, at that. So I'll post a link in the chat. Um, we also have the Oz IoT Meetup on November 15th. And the last thing is I'm always looking to hear from API developers, API docs writers. Um, especially if you haven't used Tosha Dev before, I want to hear from you even more. So you can um, email us, contact me on LinkedIn, find me on Twitter, something like that, um, and connect with me so I can learn more. So um, we're building out our API feature roadmap and I want to hear what people need. All right, so do let me know here, you know, any questions, if you have API requests that Telstra can expose to make your lives easier, always let me know. But uh, for now, I'll uh, stop sharing and uh, take some questions. Thanks, Michelle. All right. You're, You're welcome. welcome. Okay, let me have a look. Yeah. Um, okay, here's one from Cameron. How do you prioritize which stakeholders you give the most attention to? That's a good question. That's something I struggle with every day. Um, it depends on what your goals are, like at, at a certain period of time. So, for example, you know, when I first started, I just really wanted to understand the APIs and I really wanted to, you know, do my external advocacy. So I was you know, having a lot more customer interviews, um, going to a lot of events and just talking to people rather than talking like as a speaker, just talking to people on the side. Um, and then like more lately, we've been focusing internally on how can we make sure that these products um, are exactly what we need to be giving to our developers now that I understand a bit more about the developers. So you, you always need to have both. Um, you can't just go to the people that are yelling at you the most. So that's how, like I said, you're you're everything to everyone. You have a lot of expectations. So um, it's easy just to greater people that are, that are yelling at you, but like to, to help. Um, so yeah, it's, it's hard, yeah. Um, how important is it for developers to understand the role of developer advocate? That's a great question, thank you. Uh, is that Salt Mill that posted that one? <laughs> um, it's, it's really important because I don't want the developer, so for me, like my main role, like I said, I spend most of my time supporting developers. So they have a, they have a problem with API, they have a question, they, like I want to help them. So I want them to be comfortable to come to me for anything, like DM me on Twitter, DM me on LinkedIn, send me an email. Um, so I don't want them to think that this is a marketing role. I don't want them to think this is a sales role because it's not. And if what you want isn't served by Telstra, I'll send you somewhere else. Like it's not, it's not like that. Um, so it's important for me that our developers understand that I'm there to help them um, and then I'm not part of the sales and marketing team. Um, but their interactions have been great. Like I think developers are really, especially with Telstra, they don't expect that they're going to have the opportunity to talk one-on-one -on -one to someone to troubleshoot something, right? They expect that Telstra's a big company. It's going to go into a ticket somewhere and never be looked at again. That's not how it works here. You know, you can email me directly and, and we'll help you. So um, the interactions have been really, really positive. Um, next question from Chris. As a developer advocate, do you also write and test APIs? Yes. So I'm usually the first person to test APIs because I need to put my like developer hat on and say, okay, what is this experience like? And would I be prepared to put this in front of one of my customers or one of my developers? So I usually catch things out that the you know, engineering team thinks is okay, but I'm like, oh, that's not really a good customer experience, not really a good developer experience. So can we please fix that kind of thing? So not, I don't test the APIs from like a functionality perspective. I test them from like a developer experience perspective. Um, yeah, I don't write APIs, no, but with the documentation, it's more like, I need to understand the documentation because I need to take developers through it. And if I find places where the documentation is going in the wrong direction or it doesn't sound right, um, I will go back to our engineering team and, and help them work through how we can reword it. So um, the answer is yes and no. Um, cool. I think there's um, 
One other question that I don't really understand from Shauna. I don't know if it's a question. So customer retention is something that, you know, of course we yeah, really was, focus on. So I was yeah, wondering if your job was more of a customer retention, like the, um, the people that come in as developers and become part of this kind of this network, do you mm -hmm. need to keep track of them on like a KPI type of thing where you're saying, okay, we've brought in this many new development people. Um, they've actively participated in training. Is it that kind of a corporate thing or is it a little bit more, I mean, I just was trying to figure out, I wasn't really worded well. It was the start of us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think, um, you'll, How yeah, you you'll find that every, yeah, you'll find that every developer advocate has a three like key goals in mind. Um, there's like customer acquisition. So finding new customers, but not like, not in terms of attributing that to a sales thing, but it's sort of like, someone's come into our site and they're interested, like that's enough. Like we're, we're getting people awareness. So it's like awareness. Um, there's satisfaction. So there's one thing for a developer to be using our product, but are they enjoying it? So satisfaction is making sure that the documentation is written well, the developer experience is good and the website is good and that kind of stuff. And then the third one would be like the engagement. So now that they're on there and they like it, like what, how far into the journey did they get? Are they, do they drop off at some point? You know, why is that? Um, maybe, you know, it, it's like, again, it's because it tells you so big, people don't usually come and, and offer these things to us. They won't say like, oh, I actually found it really hard to use this API, so I'm not going to use it anymore. You have to sort of dig into it and be like, hey, I, I just noticed you haven't been using it very often. Um, is there a problem? And usually they'll say, oh, yeah, like I was too busy to ask you or too nervous to ask you or I thought it was my problem, you know. So, um, yeah, that's definitely in terms of the answer. Yes, customer retention is something that we pay attention to. but um, yeah, so it's those three main, main things. And they all come back to developer experience. So are you creating something that, that developers want to use? Yeah, thanks. Um, we're just on time, so I might give back to Swap Neil for now. Um, uh, you guys have, um, I had to post a few things, links in the chat, which I didn't, but um, maybe you know, if you can deal with those, those later and I'll, um, yeah, you can reach out to me anytime on LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever. All right. Thanks, Michelle. Yep. Um, thanks for your talk. And if you wanted to post it on the maybe the meetup page where we had the event, you can put it in the comments. Or sure. Feel free to send it to me, and I'll post it in there. So yep, we can work that out. Um, so yeah, thanks Good everyone idea. for um, attending today's talks, and I really love Madden Michelle. I think it was a nice sort of a diverse set of talks. Um, and like I said before, this is the last meetup for the year. We'll probably start regroup early next year. The conference is coming up on the 3rd and 4th of December. So if you haven't got your tickets, tickets are selling fast and we'll try and cut off the tickets a week before the conference, just so that we have all the logins and everything set up for the, for the online platform. And if you've got any other questions, if you want to volunteer for the conference, we, we do require a few volunteers on a couple of, you know, sort of roles if you are interested feel free to get in touch with me. But yeah, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for a lovely year. Thank you.